We've got some fresh new young talent doing some things that I know you haven't heard before. One, two, three, listen. Welcome to Finances, your home for all things financial, investment, money, and lifestyle. Hosted and curated by the very talented team of certified financial planners and Burke Britain Financial Partners. This is the Finances Podcast, episode number 70. Uh, Today, joined by three guests, uh, three people that have uh, lives have intertwined through sports, academia, business community for the better part of 50 years. I think you said that this morning, Peter, or yesterday. Very, very close to 49. Mm -hmm. Early next year, it'll be 49 years. So to my right, Peter Burke, founder, director at Burke Britain. Uh, In front of me, Brian Cook, chief executive officer of the Carlton Football Club. And Bruce Anderson, Chairman of Youth Thrive Victoria. And did I get this right, Bruce? Founder of the Armstrong Partnership. Is that Anderson correct? Partnership. What did I say? Armstrong. Yeah, Anderson Partnership. <laughs> That's right. That, that did help. <laughs> <laughs> so the great intro. I've stuffed up the intro already. I was always, always worried. Uh, whenever Peter's on the podcast, I'm always concerned that uh, it's hard to rein him in. Now I've got three of his mates here. Uh, They're all I'm, worse than me. Yeah, so I was thinking, how do I bookend this conversation? I sent Peter a, a little note this morning, so maybe we could uh, open with sort of a short history of the three of you and how you uh, came together at your uni days. In the middle of uh, the conversation, maybe talk about your careers, the principles of business that you've applied, and then close out with some of the community uh, involvements the three of you have partnership with of recent times. So... PB, if anyone's listened to episode one of the podcast, <laughs> uh, they've heard your entire life history. I Bri- promise, briefly. promise I won't go here. Very quickly, <laughs> you landed at uni as a 21 and a uh, half year old almost with your big brother Clayton tagging along a bit over one, one and a bit. And uh, that was at the beginning of 1975, left the country town of Horsham and ventured into the big smoke. Shit frightened, but it was a great thing to do, I thought. And... Uh, here we are, nearly 50 years later, and I had the pleasure of um, running into a couple of fantastic people, Brian and Bruce, at uh, very early in that, I think, March of 1975, when we all landed at Rusden State College, which is now part of the Deakin University umbrella. Well, I remember back a little bit further than that, <laughs> is that we went to a camp down at Banksia Peninsula in Gippsland, and I do remember you two blokes... Um, hitchhiking, walking into the pub <laughs> at the middle of that camp. Uh, oh, that was that was pre pre uni day, wasn't it? it was the, like an orientation camp? Yeah, it certainly <laughs> oriented me to what was going on. I didn't go. You were a naive country boy straight out of year twelve, mate. I, I can't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> it was a hell of a trip back I, from I'm the pub. Th- I'm going to say I'm not going to remember a lot of today. Actually, <laughs> it's so a safer so thing not to remember. Yeah. yeah. So similarly, I turned up at Ruston. I grew up in Hamilton. And um, I'm interesting, you know, country connections. My mum um, grew up in Horsham, so she knew Peter's mum and his dad. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, it was, it was really big. Um, I remember my dad let me drive across town and dropped me off where I was boarding. And um, I just really, and I had a push bike to get to and from uni, which was about, I don't know, in those days, three miles away. And, um, yeah, it, 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 we were just talking about it this morning. It was the, I mean, it's, I was the, last person to get a spot at Ruston. <laughs> so I was officially the dumbest that turned up. <laughs> uh, but uh, one of the best decisions ever made um, was to go to Ruston and found my tribe. And there were, we were talking about it this morning and there were seven of us that were mates and five of us were from the country. Mm. And Cookie was an outlier and another bloke um, lived right in the middle of the city and a private school boy. It was quite different to the rest of us, but uh, we were friends and still in contact with one another. Absolutely. When you say Cookie was the outlier, is that because you were a big city boy? You are in Melbourne after r- yeah. being raised in Scotland? <coughs> yeah, no, I was a city boy. Um, uh, I was actually born in Scotland and, and bred in South Melbourne and Box Hill, basically, uh, and a bit of Blackburn. So, um, yeah, I, I rolled up with these guys back in uh, 75. I actually forgot the year until I asked <laughs> Peter this morning. Um, but I, I, I did the matric in, I think, 73, and I had a year at... Turak Teachers College, which I didn't like. I, I was one of 32 students in the uh, primary school um, teaching uh, certificate, and I was the only male. In the <laughs> and I found it really, really difficult. Um, 
I found the teaching good, but I found I found that just being part of that, that one in 32, being a real minority. Anyway, uh, I actually got into, uh, then I, I, I changed my direction and went into uh, phys ed teaching at, at Rosden and uh, met these guys. Um, there was a group of, you know, probably six, seven, eight of us that, uh, that kept, a, you know, we had our own sort of gang, I suppose, <laughs> is the best way of putting it, and we kept together. Um, cheap meals over at Monash. We had, we had cheap <laughs> meals, and, uh, you know, we all, all, always found a way of getting through our exams and passing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Collaboration, mate. It's, it's it was, it was, uh, we, we, we were a very inclusive group. Um, Before our times, collaborating in exams. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it, 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 Rooster remind Roosters, uh, Bruce. Rooster reminded me of uh, <laughs> one of our exams that I sat in the middle of the three of them, and I, I, I remember halfway through the exam, I just made the comment to both one of you two have got this wrong. <laughs> 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 and he wasn't sitting next to me. <laughs> so, so what was the appeal of, uh, were you all doing the physical education component of uh, the Bachelor of Education or was it just a Bachelor of Education? What was it? It, it ends up the qualifications of Bachelor of Education, but we went there to study phys ed and, a... and get around with all the other jocks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, and um, you know, there were some significant sports people in our, in our um, co- amongst our colleagues. You know, we're chatting today, one of our... Mates from those days is, um, you know, this is might be his last week um, on earth, and he was the Victorian decathlon champion. And we had league footballers, and we had great tennis players, and then we had blokes just like me that could get a kick of footy in the country, and that's about the only place. <laughs> well, Cookie was one of those league footballers. Yeah, he was. So, yeah. No, I was a, uh, a very, very, uh, very, very average reserves player at Hawthorne at the time. I was uh, a lot better than yeah. us, mate. A lot yeah. better I, than when, us. When I arrived at uh, Hawthorne, I was, I was playing for. Sorry, arrived at Rosedon. I was playing for Hawthorne. I was married. Yeah. And I had an F.E. Holden that had smoke coming out of the <laughs> out of the, uh, the the bottom part of the the floor. <laughs> and and, and, and I, I was on the. I, 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 we had no money whatsoever. You're very well positioned. You know, and, and being a reserves player at Hawthorne meant that you got like. I, I remember my first check that I got from it. It was one hundred and eighty dollars for the year. Good God! You know, <laughs> I got more than that playing at Oakley. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, probably in the reserves. <laughs> I, asked, I asked you this yesterday. Did you and Cookie play against each other, or, I, or I not? Don't you? Were, you don't played? So. Um, did you play VFA at all, mate? Yeah, no, I played for Box Hill. Yeah, what um, years did you oh, play? Oh, golly, there you've got me there. Seventy-three, four. Would be, okay, would well, be I, my I guess. didn't go to Oakley until seventy-six, I think. Yeah, so my yeah. Last two or three years at uni, I was at Oakley. So yeah, first division though, Oakley, and, and, and Box Hill were, they were on the bottom of the second division when I was there. <laughs> I played 32 games for Box Hill Seniors as yeah. a youngster, yeah. that I was 18 or something, and we won one game, one <laughs> game. I went back there to give a speech, a talk one day to the Box Hill. They asked me back and I, I spoke to their sponsors and I was, I was handed a... Uh, a huge photograph of the team of that day that won one game in 32, you know. It was, it was quite a stand out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, no, not really. I think it's worth adding, though, that, you know, Cookie was so determined to play league footy. I mean, that's the thing that stood out to me in our four years, like he was just so determined to play league footy. And um, years later, um, uh, I think we all got to know David Parkin, but, you know, people do, and David's view of Cookie was he's the hardest worker he's ever had. In, in any footy club, but just not quite got it. So didn't you're leave bit, anything behind. You're a bit stiff, mate, weren't you? Like you went overseas, uh, one of the uni break, and mm. went to uh, Asia, came back with a, yeah, a parasite back, in your guts. Came and back with Giardia and lost about 10 kilos. I was going to say you lost lose. a massive... Well, you were yeah. a different bloke. Like I remember seeing yeah. you when we went came yeah. back, you yeah. looked like you'd faded away. And yeah, no, I lost a lot That away, buggered yeah. things up a bit, made yeah. it a bit hard to be competitive. Yeah, yeah. And, it was, and I was young at that time. I think I was 22 or something, can't remember, but... Uh, we did a, th- I did a, I shouldn't have done this, but a, between seasons I did a 30-day tour of Thailand <laughs> uh, through what was known as the Australian Union, Union of Students who went bankrupt at one stage. You know. <laughs> but we, we jumped on a bus and we basically did 30 days. We went around the outside of Thailand, mm. you know, uh, and people just didn't do that. You know, we went into the Triangle and, you know, uh, Chiang Mai and it was a dirt road then and... I always remember going to a, to a restaurant and I asked for steak in Chiang Mai. And I, and <laughs> How I got, do you spell I, that? I, I, yeah, and, I, and, and this was 1976 or seven, I think. Mm. Anyway, maybe eight, 78. And uh, I remember um, them serving me this piece of something. 
<laughs> I just couldn't eat it. I felt it was monkey. It I was actually <laughs> felt it must have been monkey. <laughs> well, they tricked you. It's interesting <laughs> that time as well. So my other recollection of that time. So I had the good fortune to pair up with Peter and um, do teaching rounds together. And, um, and Great times. Yeah, they were really good times. And, and but, but the thing I remember most about Peter is that he was really battling. You know, a, as a as a y- young dad, Lynn and he down in Melbourne, you know, really battling financially, even though we had studentships, but it was just really tough. And, you know, he had night jobs, he had weekend jobs, he was playing footy for money and doing all those things. But he was just really good fun to be around, you know, in the midst of all that. And... Um, and our teaching rounds were fabulous. We had a guy called Tony Harold who was a lecturer at Phys Ed at Melbourne Uni and um, he showed that much confidence that in both of us that he went on long service leave and they didn't replace him and we just did it together. Students teaching yeah. on our own. How long for? A uh, term. A whole okay. term. Mm. Yeah, with one, when it was three terms, not four. Yeah. The third of the year. Mm. Yeah. You've, you've always been easy to be with. <laughs> but that, 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 that's a real credit to you. I mean, mm. it, it, to be in the same room and actually enjoy pe- a person's company and it's easy to be with yeah. is, a, is a great attribute to have and you've got that. Mm. Thank you very much, mm. guys. Mm. You're not always, though. <laughs> not always. <laughs> He's not when I'm the dad. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the business partner. Mm. And on the, on the education front, you didn't all go on to teaching roles, did you, Cookie? You went. Uh, no, I. I, I um, this will be a good story. I, no, I think mm. I, I think I would have been a reasonable teacher, but I, I went on to do a master's degree, and um, mainly because I didn't know what to do. So when what, I finished what? my degree, and so I, and and also I'd, I'd been approached uh, by a WFL club, a waffle club. So that was a master's in education. So I did a master's in there, yeah, yep. yeah, in yeah. Perth. So it was, we did a bachelor of education in human movement at Rosden, and then I did an MED in in uh, human movement again at uh, University of West Australia. And it was one of the only one of one of two, I think, institutions around Australia that had a master's degree at that point of time, um, which was 1979. Um, and I, I took the path of doing it by coursework, and most of the coursework was in, um, uh, it wasn't in the science area, it wasn't phys- physiology and, and so forth, it was, it was more around the sports admin side. And so I, I, there was a couple of really good lecturers who I clung to, and, and uh, they pointed me in the right direction around you know, long-term planning in sports administration. Um, so you didn't have any great insight that the professional world of sport was going to be burgeoning. It was just mm. happenstance that uh, you landed in that area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I it, it, it was more, I think, still having an ambition to play footy and an ambition to, to learn more. I suppose, to be honest. They both and fitted together pr- both quite fitted, neatly. Fitted, yeah. fitted well. So, my uh, what was supposed to be a two years masters course, I did the, I did the entire course in a year. Uh, I got through all of the units. Who uh, was teaching? Twelve you? units. <laughs> Who were you sitting next to? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's probably some truth in that. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I did the master's degree, and uh, uh, when I when I finished that, in, and I was married and had uh, two kids by then, you know, too. So. Uh, we went early, <laughs> and by the time um, uh, we finished the master's degree, I actually got a. Uh, I, I was working in two or three part-time roles, but I ended up getting a full-time role with um, athletics, WA Athletics, and they, they had this uh, combination of little ats and senior ats, and I was I was sort of uh, trying to integrate both, so that was my role, full-time role for a little while. Yeah, and Rooster? I went teaching. Um, <laughs> back to Burke country. <laughs> uh, I went to Warwickville, which is half an hour north of Horsham, and ended up playing footy against legs. David Burke, um, mm. your uncle and uh, Peter's brother, and he was a fab- fabulous footballer. Um, had a couple of years in Warwickville, loved it. Um, fortunately enough, moved to Wangaratta rather than getting stuck there. Um, and I, I had ten years teaching in in the in, really in the country. So. Warwick to start with and then up around Wangaratta and in the northeast in a variety of different schools. I loved teaching until I didn't yeah. and um, and I was gone. I left I left within three or four months. So when was that? How long ago was that? Um, oh, so uh, I left teaching in the... End of the 80s. Yeah, the late 80s. Did you leave it? You did an MBA at RMIT. Was that straight after you left? Uh, no, so I set up a little business of my own um, doing corporate health programs and... Um, and running leadership and team things for businesses, very naively. 
Um, and uh, my biggest client was HBA, the health insurance fund, now Bupa. And uh, within a couple of years, I could see they were shutting stuff down in the country. And so I moved from the Wangaratta, where I was based, down to Melbourne. So my MBA was after that, really to prove to me that I was, you know, capable of um, being a business person, you know, because I, um, I've, I've always been confident, but um, I wasn't sure, you know, so um, that's why I studied and, and uh, you know, it was a really good step. But the, the big step for me was doing a thing called the Williamson Community Leadership Program. And um, it was, it, I learned more from that than doing my MBA. Okay. What was, uh, it, what was the key takeouts from that? Uh, the people in the program. So it goes for a year. And a couple of them are um, Geelong people. So Heather Wellington was on our program and she was the Director of Emergency Medicine here. Um, Stretchgo um, was uh, studying law down here at that stage. But we had guys like Murray Frey that owned Spotlight Stores in it. Um, just people from all... So they put 30 people together, 10 of you from business, 10 of them from um, government organisations and 10 from community. And you go through the year tackling different issues, um, you know, meeting, um, listening to people that, that you only read about in the paper. And uh, so you might... St- you know, one of the things might be on the criminal justice system and, you know, there's a guy, John Van Groningen, who was the head of the prison, so I just remember him, he's like a hard man. And uh, Neil Comrie, who I later sat on a board with, um, was the chairman of the of the police. And, and I was just so naive when these guys spoke and spoke about the evils that, you know, are part of um, our community, you know, that was, you know, mind-blowing for me. And then, yeah, just... It was, it was, that was the thing and you were confronted with things you had to um, didn't understand and would um, build an opinion on and then you know we were mainly left leaning but had some real right wingers in it as well so it was really that um, covering learning that issues so I came from the country I'd lived my life nearly all my life there and things in the country are very black and white um, that's right that's wrong those sort of things and, and I learned from this program that life's grey Lots and lots of it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. <coughs> it's interesting you talk about how you you evolved from uni to Warwick Nabeel and then into business. But I remember back to when you got Warwick Nabeel and all I wanted to do when I finished uni was to get out of the city and get back to a small country town. I applied for every small country spot that was available and you get bloody Warwick Nabeel <laughs> and I get sent to this damn city called Geelong. It was just, what? How the hell did this happen? And I... <laughs> I promised my Jay's mum, my wife at the time, that I promised two years that's it and we'll find a country spot. Anyway, and that's now Geelong has been home for almost all of your life. I think Jay was one and a little bit, one and a bit when we landed here at the beginning of 79. Your big brother was ready to start primary school, five and a bit, and the Geelong's become home. But like you, Bruce, I got to the point, like Cookie, you wanted to find what you wanted to do and footy got you to the studies. We both taught, and you said when you loved it, but then all of a sudden you realised you didn't love it. I was the same. I got to the point. (coughs) All of a sudden I realised that I just didn't have the passion for it anymore, and the kids deserve way more than someone who was just turning up for a paycheck. Yeah, yeah. And when you think, I'm looking at 50, 55-year-old teachers just hanging around for retirement, you know, waiting for the end of their work life and turning up just to pick up a paycheck, I don't want to be seen like they are, so... Mm. I think I was 40 when I decided I wanted to get out and I was gone by my 41st birthday. And that was 16 years I lasted, so different teaching careers beyond our four years oh, together at college. Yeah. But There's uh, some correlation there because uh, I don't know whether Cookie was the inspiration for you to maybe move down that sports management path when you and David Matthews headed up mm. the road. Maybe Was it David Parkin that you actually went to? David was one of our lecturers, yep. yeah, exactly right, at uh, Deakin Burwood. So. I, I, I was lying in hospital after my first hip replacement. I f- just had my 41st birthday in November. And uh, David Matthews, who was a mate, I was coaching the Geelong interleague side and he was the GFL uh, general manager at the time as a young back straight out of uni. And um, David came in to visit me in hospital and said, guess what, I've just found this um, course I'm going to do next year, this master's in sports management. I said, shit, I've just got a letter to say that they've accepted my redundancy. I need something to do. I might do it with you. So, <laughs> And again, because, you know, <coughs> Cookie being in sports management, I guess that was one of the things that you think about an area you'd like to work in. Mm. So you, tra- definitely, you definitely weren't thinking financial planning. No, shit, no. It was not even on the radar. It was just, uh, I'm, I'm going to do this course because I think if I want a career other than 
teaching, I'd like a career in sport. Well, thank goodness I didn't get it because I know how much time you put in, Cookie. It's just a 24-7 <laughs> uh, consuming task. Mm. I, I had the pleasure of still doing lots of sport stuff. Mm, mm. But as a hobby and as a pleasure, rather than it being a demanding mm. job, and I mm. then accidentally, after I ran out of money, first year at uni, was okay, and then all of a sudden you got no money left and I needed a job. Mm. And one of our very good mates, my mate from year seven days in high school, Bruce Leslie, who's still yeah. one of my very best mates, happened at the time to be managing GIO for <coughs> Victoria. And uh, he said, well, I can get you a gig. I'll introduce you to the local manager, but you've got to promise you'll stay for at least two years or you'll embarrass me. And that was um, at the beginning of... 1996, February. I walked in the door, 20th of February, 1996. Geez, you've got a good memory. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I had to do, I had to cram some of the Diploma of Financial Planning stuff, otherwise I wouldn't get in. So I think I did three units, you know, over the summer break and then went back and said, I've got them, mm. three of the eight units. And Richard Hughes, who was also <laughs> a good friend and client and still. From Hamilton. And a Hamilton boy as well. Hughes, he said, well, I guess if Bruce Leslie said you're okay and you've got some Diploma... Uh, units already I guess I have to give you a job and uh, for the first three mm. four months oh, I shit myself I had no idea what I was doing I was terrified I was a fish mm. out of water completely but gradually you find your way yeah. you find and you know doors open you find mm. things that you're passionate about and things that you enjoy doing uh, here we are now you fast forward about four years from mm. when you first got into financial planning and there's another intersection with mm. Bruce being potentially your first uh, consulting client. Is that right, Bruce? You, when Peter was making a decision about yeah, going self-employed? Yeah, he still employed. hasn't sent me the bill for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I've been paid many times over. Um, yeah, it was, it was, I mean, it was a really big decision. So GIO were, um, they had paid planners and, and I think at the time I'd have been working at the Bendigo Bank, maybe in okay. financial, pl so running their financial planning business. And, yeah. And Peter was umming and ahhing, and and and, you, and Lynn, your mum, Jay, she was really very concerned about going out into business, and just you know, great woman, Lynn, but very conservative, and and rightfully worried about her kids and all that sort of stuff, and and we spent a day, we spent a day in the old GIO office with butcher's paper and stuff like that, and and it was, it was like really, it was a no-brainer that you know, with Peter's as, as Cookie pointed out before. Berkey's people skills and he's, he's a big intellect like you know we had a lot of smart people at uni and and Peter was right in amongst them at the top and Cook and I were hanging off the back <laughs> <laughs> just hanging on You're too kind. but so so you know those things came together and it's the best decision that his clients have ever had made for them even if it was 20 30 years ago you know the, he's just made for this sort of work there, there was a, another intersection uh, in our business I can't remember when in the 2000s it was PB when uh, when I came on board, maybe 2002 and beyond, and you handed me a book uh, by Jim Collins, yeah. Good to Great. And I'm not sure whether we we're trying to work it out yesterday. I know there was a book, a Cookie, that your old club produced, which was called Good to Great. And uh, I'm assuming, I'll make the assumption that that uh, was born out of uh, Jim Collins' philosophy on business. Uh, I wanted to touch on, maybe for all of you from a, from a business point of view, what, what areas of... Um, uh, what sort of philosophy, business philo philosophy and individual philosophies you've used in your business successes? And I suppose I'll hand over to you first, Cookie, uh, maybe even talk about the in introduction or influence of that Jim Collins Good to Great book and its philosophy. <coughs> hmm, okay. Um, yeah, no, the Jim Collins book uh, was a, was, had a great effect on me. Uh, and that's actually, I think that came out probably... 15 years ago, 20 years oh, ago. Oh, it was late, oh, 90, than, late yeah. 90s. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. and, and uh, yeah, I sort of, I think I, well, I'm pretty sure I based my, my leadership principles around that, that book for a while, not, not forever. Um, uh, yeah, there's been, a, there's a few things I wouldn't, uh, right now there's a couple of things I don't agree with in terms of the principles, some of the principles, but at the time I was, you know, I was very much um, embraced, I very much embraced the Jim Collins theories and principles. Um, and and the, the whole thing was about going from good to great. Um, and when I first arrived at Geelong um, Football Club in 1999, uh, it was very obvious that we had to elevate our, our standards. Um, uh, and, and that was the time I, I read the book as well. So it, 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 it came at the right time. Um, uh, 
its its principles were were very much around uh, you know what uh, what how many uh, developing a level, level five leadership which is, which is about ensuring you that you you have not got arrogance there's no hubris uh, you 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 concern yourself with um, uh, with accountability of people but at the same time provide a lot of support um, and, and out of out of the book that would be the main takeaway for me. Uh, which is in a high performance area, if you want to improve performance, it's not simply about accountability, which is important by the way, but it's also about providing the same dose of support as, as, as accountability, the same energy, the same amount of time and, that you provide and, and to people. Um, uh, the resources you put into developing uh, teams, developing people, it's about accountability and having goals, but it's also very much about support and engagement uh, and figuring out ways of doing both. So you mentioned there would be a few elements there that mm. you probably wouldn't resonate with you today with mm. uh, a, a few years more of experience under your belt. Which would they be? Oh, I, I, I think um, uh, what <laughs> what he did, he, he, he said, here's 100 companies and here here is uh, here is why they're successful. And then about uh, 10 years later when uh, half of them weren't successful, he went back and indicated that... Um, uh, and, and studied why they weren't successful, and he said they should be successful, and came up with a major reason of hubris. And I'm not so sure that's right. Okay. I, I think it's more complicated than, than that. I think, Cookie, you'd agree. Though. Like the, those sort of the philosophy, whether it be business or life philosophies. Mm. I mean, none of them are completely right, and none of them are com completely wrong. No. And you know, taking from. Jim Collins, good yeah. to great. There are pieces of that that are gold, yeah. but there are pieces of that that probably don't apply. Yeah. And they may have applied 20 years ago, but they don't apply now. And I think yeah. that's probably the challenge in leading, yeah. is to actually pick yeah. the best pieces, learn from, pick the <coughs> best pieces. I mean, your life in, you know, with a variety of different business roles, Bruce, you know, like moving to different organisations and picking up what you've learnt previously and adding value, but also learning from the new place, how you can be better. Mm. I think that you know that's all of us. We've just got to keep learning. We've got to keep improving and changing, and not not believe that we know, and therefore it's right. Like if we continue to challenge our own thinking and our own awareness, mm. then we will continue to improve. Which means those around us have got a chance to improve as well. Well, I think we showed that in the last five minutes of our breakfast this morning. You know, we're sharing tips with one another about stuff we've read or seen, or uh, or asking each other's impression about. You know, this is something I'm thinking of, and. You know, I learn from these two guys all the time and um, I had a, a challenging issue with a client recently and you know, just caught up with Cookie, dropped into his place and you know, just came up and he just gave me this, this, this you know, fabulous question to ask. And um, yeah, so you know, my tip is hang around with good people. Yeah. Uh, reading the Anderson Partnership <laughs> website, Bruce, <laughs> one of the things you mentioned on there is around execution. I, I think back to when I read Good to Great and... I look back now and think I misinterpreted a lot of it, like getting the right people on the bus to me was get everyone on the bus and then <laughs> and, you know, just get everyone and uh, try to have some level of decentralised command and give people ownership, but it created more, more uh, HR and people issues that we weren't able to manage. Um, so the execution of the principles, yep. you mentioned on your website how important a plan is, but the execution. So, I mean, in your world of consulting, uh, how do you uh, take a plan, a theory, and execute with with a level of success? Um, so the I'm a planner, right? So that's that's who I am. So it's a natural thing. But the the key, uh, and I'm not a strategic planner, so that's not my area of expertise. So what I'm really good at is that's a great strategic plan. I love that. Um, what do we need to get done this year? What do you need to get done this year to hit your three-year mark or five-year or whatever you've put out there because it's only a direction. I mean, to call it a strategic plan is, from my perspective, it's a nice word to have, but it's actually a strategic direction and what are the key things you're driving at. And so from there is for a CEO to have five, no more than five because you can put them on one hand and you can list them off. I've got five things I'm working on this year and I need to get those done and then we'll be successful. And then each one of their direct reports has got five things that they're working on. And... and the way you can present them is lots of different ways, but it's only five. And I had to laugh. I was doing <laughs> doing some work um, pretty close to here a few years ago, and and they uh, and they had seventy one 
key result here is. I just thought that's uh, it's just not possible. I mean, you can't remember 10% of those. <laughs> so how can you get them done? So, so it's that. So it's an, an annual plan and then pulling it back into quarterly instalments to say, if we're going to end up at the end of the year, so me as the CEO, what are the five things I've got to concentrate on this quarter and get nailed this quarter in order to get to where I need to be at the end of the year and share and, and have the exec team share their three-month their three month plan with each other. I'm committed to doing this. I'm relying on you to do that. Um, this is what I'm worried about. So really simple session. And then three months later, have get together again. This is what I promised I'd do. I didn't get this one done. I got these done. This is what held me up. Um, and you know, and to be held account, held to account for those things. And and for me, that's the that's been the really key thing. And I think the point that Cookie makes is, you know, accountability comes up a lot in my conversations with CEOs, and that's who I work with. Um, but but it's it, it it's around clarity. So what do you really want from somebody? Like just be so clear about it. You've got to be hundred percent clear, and they need to be as well. And you need to agree that. But then, you know, so much time goes into supporting them to, you know, to being a mentor, to being a coach, to being, you know, just doing those things. So that, that'd be the key, of, the key to the success of my work and asking really good questions. So I don't know much, but I know a lot of good questions. What, what makes a good question, Bruce? Uh, something that causes the person to reflect on what they're doing or what they're planning to do and thinking about it a second time. And then when they even come up with that is to... so. Uh, I mean, in blunt terms, an open question, you know, so of what, when, how, where, why, so people have to explain themselves is, um, you, know, uh, you know, something with just a yes or no or two simple answers, that, that, that doesn't work. Let me try a, qu- a decent question. So you yeah. can tell me whether it's any good or not. This is probably for all of you. So under this idea of success principles, I was thinking about, obviously, we're a financial planning practice. Uh, Cookie, you're managing uh, uh, a national football team and Bruce you, you've got your consulting business consulting business but what's what's the best advice financial or otherwise you've been given and implemented that's actually equated to some success in your life so financial otherwise whether it's personal what is it uh, that you could potentially share and if it's a bad question Rooster just say it's a no, shit no, no. question Jay well uh, no because you've asked an open question so giving people a chance to interpret it so I've given these two blokes a chance to think and they can come up with the first answer <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think if I want to jump in um, the, be- the best thing was that it harks back to um, a bloke who I, I don't know personally I'm well, sorry I don't know well but I've met a few times through my friend David Matthews as Kevin Sheedy and Kevin Sheedy who's you know cunning as a rat, you know, like a fantastic um, leader who managed to succeed for a long time in AFL footy. And his, his, which really resonated with me when he said the reason that I've managed to stay relevant and successful for so long is that I know that I don't know everything and I <coughs> make sure that I surround myself with really smart people that cover all of my weaknesses. And I haven't got an ego. I don't need to be the bloke, the, you know, the level five leader. I don't need to be the the bloke who is uh, going to get pats on the back all the time. I just need to have things successful. And I think as a, a, a general principle in life and in, in business, don't think you know it all. Accept that you don't know it all. Surround yourself with fantastic people, friends that you can be your, your mentors and your discussion points. And I'd like to think that lots of my friends over life use me as a mentor. And I know that I do that a lot with my friends. And I think if you can accept the fact that you don't know it all, and you need to have good people around you that can fill in all the gaps. And I think we've pretty much done that in the business here. We bring really good people in to fill all the gaps. And I know that I'm shit ass at a number of things. I'm happy to put my hand up and say that because others can get the credit for those things that they do really well. So that's a long answer to a short question. But I think that to me is a life, business, sports clubs, general principle that I think is really relevant. Sorry, Cookie, your turn. Uh, like you, it's about people. Um, it's not simply about finance, but very, a very, <laughs> a very simple uh, learning was, you know, just, 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 just make more cash than you spend. <laughs> you know, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, yeah. uh, when, when we try, we may have all these complex uh, structures around finances, and, and you know, but that's, that's a, that was a key one. Um, and the other one, um, 
particularly through football when we had all the stadium developments and, and you know, with clubs getting into debts to do that, was you know, don't grow yourself into bankruptcy. So I, I kept a really good uh, eye on, you know, um, our debt, uh, our repayment schedule, um, how, you know, our, our finances over the next five to ten years and how we could pay off debt. Um, and link that up with a, a relatively conservative growth plan rather than saying we can actually pay this debt off yeah. with it, as long as we make 10 percent increase each year which you know is very very challenging boisterous <laughs> okay yeah. so I, I, I went down the conservative model uh, long-term growth um, and ensuring each year we, we, we actually made more cash we had, we had cash coming more cash coming in than going out yeah pretty simple it is simple, isn't it? Yeah. But, um, <laughs> I was going to say that, that simple philosophy of yeah. uh, cash flow management, uh, applicable to from a business point of view, mm. applicable to an individual. And one of the things that I've heard probably you say and a few of the other advisors here on a business and personal front is that it's very easy to grow into an income, but it's very hard to grow out of expenses. When you yeah. continue to grow at the same pace as your income, it's yeah. very hard to then wind that back later yeah. after the fact. Yeah. Um, Bruce, if you've, had, yeah, so you've had five yeah, minutes to yeah, think now. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to probably answer the previous question and this one at the same time and because and I think time. the other ones... Could take the other ones, time. Yeah, it will. Uh, <laughs> so, so um, you know, my um, I learnt the important things in life at home. Um, so um, uh, hopefully I won't get teary. I'll be copying Berkey then. Um, <laughs> so, so my mum and dad were community leaders. Um, both were. And um, so as the kids went through schools, guides, netballs, all those sort of things, my parents were involved and, um, and made a really big contribution in, all the communi- in our community broadly. And they were based around respect for others um, and respect was by listening to them. Um, my dad was not always good at it. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, but that was the, the key thing. So... When I'm asked, you know, what's been your success, I'd say I've, I, if I look, I had do look back now and go, I've, I'm really proud of making my contribution to the community, to my family, um, to my business, to my business or businesses that I've worked in, um, my friends, um, and and that's that's been a secret, and and it's no surprise, it's a plant. So I do look at that every year, and just go through. So how am I going on these things, and what's working, and what's not. And there are some things that didn't work. So, you know, unfortunately, like the other two, you know, I had a marriage that didn't work and that was a, a, a you know, a huge thing for me and, um, and really difficult. And, and I chose to, to make the change. Um, but, yeah, just living through the principles and, and, and that comes from growing up in a Christian household um, and a strong church community that, which um, brought up all the kids. So the church had the footy club um, had had scouts, had boys clubs, had you know things like that. So it, it was is that that's the foundation of me feel it, looking back now and going, yeah, I'm really proud of what I've done and I'm satisfied and I've got more to do. But if it stops next week, I'll be disappointed. But I'll be you know hopefully the people around me will be glad I've been here. Mm. Following on from that commitment and contribution to community, one of the things I wanted to touch on today was some of the involvement that each of you had and collaborating on a couple of fronts. PB, I might get you to talk about the Future Generation program that we've been involved with for the last, I think I checked with Cindy before, I think it's six years now. Just mm-hmm. before I get you to explain how that ties into the likes of Wombat's Wish and You Thrive, uh, can you take a guess at how much Burke Britain clients, Future Generation uh, Fund and ourselves have contributed to community groups since 2017? Be three quarters of a mil, I think. Uh, about eight hundred and forty-one thousand wow. dollars in yeah. the last uh, in the last six, six years. That was that sort of stunned me. I'd, I'd not looked at the entire figures, so mm. it's pretty amazing. So maybe if you touch on the Future Generation program, and then uh, we'll hand over to uh, Cookie to talk about Wombat's Wish and uh, Rooster You Thrive. Yeah, well, we had um, one of the, the businesses that we own for all of our clients is the Future Generation Company. It's a listed investment company. Run by, set up by a bloke called Jeff Wilson who had this idea when he was in London some years back that he saw what was being done in London with these philanthropic businesses where all the people that, um, all the businesses that threw their assets into this listed investment company did so with, with an understanding they didn't accept 
well, they didn't keep management fees, that those management fees were allowed to be allocated to charities of the choice of the people running the fund. And after having been in this investment for our, with our clients for quite some time, chatting to our share broker, it just was in conversation, just said, oh, I reckon it's worth talking to FG, the company, because you've got some scale now and maybe they might be prepared to let you guys have some control over what you do with the funds that are available each year. And the FG business, look, it's handed over millions and millions of dollars across the last decade or so. Anyway, so I met with um, the chairperson at the time and Jeff Wilson in Melbourne and they said, yeah, well, you guys have got some scale. Actually, let's go through a process. So they gave us approval and that first year we had just under $150,000. We were told, and I had, didn't really know what the amount would be, but we were given, and it was sort of a, a, out of the blue, we'd met with them, they came back and said, yes, you can. We had just under $150,000, and I thought, wow, shit, like that's pretty significant, yeah. and we can control where that goes. And I will quickly touch on the fact that that amount, because we had to make a fairly quick decision, I had um, Jay and I walk Kokoda way back in 2011, and we raised some money for the Kids Plus Foundation way back then, for 38000 I think we raised with that. And so they had a bit of a link with Kids Plus, so I just rang Kids Plus and said, Sean Cannon, who happened to be the chairman at the time, or the ma general manager at the time, can I meet with you? Because I you know, might have a donation. Sure. Went over to what was their little tiny office over near the hospital, office, a little house that they looked after, about 30 cerebral palsy children each month. Very small organisation, struggling to make ends meet. But Sean was a go-getter. He said, oh, have a look at this, Peter. And he showed me the 3D images of what was going to be built on the Deakin University site at Warren Ponds. It was their new facility, their new premises. And it was wow. And um, they had funding. The Costa Foundation contributed a huge amount and they'd had other philanthropic donations. So the building itself was going to be organised. But the outside area, which was an outside recreation, relaxing area for the young kids that learn to ride a bike, learn to bounce a ball, just outside with a safe playground area, was going to cost in the vicinity of 400000 They had a philanthropic donor that was going to give dollar for dollar. They had to raise two hundred to get it done. And they were thinking it would be three or four years away. And I said, well, um, we've got close to 150. Would that help? And Sean, wow. And so the, the wonderful thing for us through the FG donation program was that we were able to hand over 150. He found the other 50 very quickly. And that outside area was done in exactly in conjunction with the building. So they opened both at the same time, which is really exciting. So as a result of that, we suddenly had this wonderful opportunity. And so each year from that point on, rather than just one mob getting it, you know, one organisation getting it, we said, let's just share this around. And we would go to our client base and get nominations. And I'd go to beautiful friends and uh, say, have, you know, people would come to me and say, hey, we've got this organisation, which I'll let you talk about, Bruce. And Cookie and I, we ran into each other at a fundraising function over at um, Alma in, uh, in Geelong. Yeah. Uh, this is, bef you know, going back probably eight or nine, ten years ago maybe now. Yeah. And we just turned up without me even knowing you were going to be there. I didn't even know what the organisation was. It was just a friend of Esther's um, who happened to be on the board. And this fundraising organisation was Wombat's Wish. Bloody hell, Wombat's Wish, what do they do? Oh, they look after children who've lost a parent. Oh, my God. That's fairly close to home for me. And anyway, so the flow on from that is that um, we are blessed as a business to have had this future generation opportunity and now, as Jay just quoted, in the last six years, we've been able to allocate 840000 to a variety of very, very needy and deserving charities that um, we just, you know, overjoyed. And, you know, I have the pleasure now of being on two of the boards, on the Wombat's Wish Board and on the Kids Plus Foundation Board, which is a bit like you, know, Bruce. I, you know, had wonderful parents that taught me to be involved in the community and give back more than you take. And, you know, it's just an absolute... And you get back more than you give. Absolutely, mate. You absolutely do. It just comes back tenfold. So that's enough from me. But that's, a, that's the FG and the uh, donation program and that opens the door for Cookie and Rooster to have a chat about your well, links with those... With those groups. With those well, groups, yeah. Um, while you were talking, I, I was thinking about lots and lots of things. But anyway, um, I, I think, you know, as... as uh, as leaders of organisations, um, uh, we add layers that, that give our companies greater meaning. 
uh, particularly in the community. And so, you know, what you've done is you've had these layers around um, charity and around doing good in the community. Um, and I think it's our role to do that. And I, I, I often ask the question, I ask this question to people and, and when I present, I say, if, you're, if your organisation didn't exist tomorrow, what difference would it make to the world? And in most cases, uh, someone can jump into that hole, banks, insurance companies, you know, if one bank goes, the clients will go to some other bank, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the aim is to try and make your company foolproof to that. Yep. So you need to add value and add meaningful layers. And in football, it's been, you know, we've added HR and a few other things. Then we added Carlton Respects, we added, um, you know, uh, our RAP plans, our multicultural plans, our Next Generation Academy. So it gives us greater meaning. Um, and so I'm a great believer in trying to make your, your company more meaningful. And, and I think the best way of doing that is to create great partnerships in your community. And they might be the ones that you created, there might be others. I remember a golf club came to me and said, we're in, real, we're in real trouble, what do we do? And I said, well, the last thing you should do is rely on golf to, make it, make, to, de to, to, to depend your future. To, mm. um, because, you know, it's so, it's so costly running a golf club. You know, it's hard to get more cash than, than, than the expenditure. So, um, uh, that w and, and I would say, look, my, my suggestion is you partner up with the schools, you partner up with the local surf club, you partner up with Rotary. Add layers to your organisation which give it greater meaning to the community. Okay, so, and I think that's good business yeah. as well. It's, it's good commercial business. Yeah. Okay, and so that's, that's my philosophy on, on why we do this stuff. In footy, uh, we once upon a time just worried about doing well on field. Uh, 10, 20 years ago, we started to think about community, so we do good in the community. And we also have this third layer now, which is about doing right from an integrity point of view, having the right values, the right culture, the right purpose, the right mission. And so, you know, we've evolved from, 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 from doing well to doing good to doing right. And I think companies should do that. Not just worry about doing well, their P&L, their balance sheet, more than that. Beautiful. Okay, yeah. doing the other things and becoming uh, something important in the community, yeah. not just something important in the business. It's a fantastic okay. point. Yeah. So, so put that to the side. Um, I'm, I, I've been with Wombat's Wish for, I think, 10 or 12 years now. With, uh, with Peter's part of the board there. I'm the patron of Wombat's Wish. Um, I lost my mum when I was nine. Uh, she, she took a, a dose of pills. Um, and uh, at that time, there was no grief counselling uh, available, really, for kids of nine years of age. There was no help at all, really. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, uh, I, I think um, uh, the only person that helped was, was probably my dad, and he wasn't great at it, you know. Mm -hmm. And so um, we, we have services now. Uh, we, have, we have trained support staff to look after particularly the younger kids who lose their, lose their parent or, or, or parents through natural or non-natural causes. And it's something close to my heart. And so that's, that's why I do, I do the Wombats Wish and I have done for, for a dozen years. I think there's a grief camp this week there in, is, in Anglesey. There is, I'm heading down there tomorrow afternoon. And, and it's yeah. basically a group of psychologists and yeah. a group of support staff who, yeah. who, who, who look after the children, give them, pro, try and provide skills to the kids to, to, to to help with how they manage their grief, which is not easy, because I remember the the, the biggest I remember the biggest feeling I had was just a pain in my heart, mm -hmm. you know, when I was nine, you know, and it went for weeks and weeks. It just I just couldn't get it out. It was like you had a uh, you'd run a marathon, you know, mm -hmm. but in your heart, your mar your heart had run a marathon. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was an amazing time um, from a, from a negative point of view. So that's that's what I do, uh, and we, you know, I I I, I can't emphasise enough to the people who listen to this. Add value to your company, add, and and think about the partnerships in your community that you can have that will will give you greater meaning to those people. Beautiful. So thanks. So if I follow on from that, so we're baby boomers, right? Um, and um, I could make a couple of really rude remarks <laughs> about what that means, but uh, and some of them are funny, but Just not in this audience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the uh, the thing that I've um, so we, we met each other studying a Bachelor of Education and 
and and I was a pretty good teacher, but not a great teacher. Um, and I've learned a lot about adolescents and young people since I stopped teaching. And so I've been involved ever since. Um, so it's more than 30 years with disadvantaged young people in, in the community. So it started off as an early intervention program for young blokes, 14 to 16, probably like Peter and I might have been <laughs> at the same, or Peter anyway. Um, but, you know, it, the, in a country town in particular, the cops know who they are. Um, they're not yet in a lot of trouble. Um, the school doesn't know them quite so well because they don't come that often. Um, and and they really are, they've got this fork in the road. And, and we used to work at that, um, a, a thing called Typo Station in North East Victoria. So that's where it started. And as I got towards the end of that, I had the good fortune to be invited onto a, a, a scholarship program for disadvantaged state school boys. And this has been now running for 80 years. You know, a guy put aside $800,000, 800,000 pounds 40 years ago, and it's now $10 million. Hmm. And it, it provides scholarships for 10 young men from disadvantaged backgrounds from state schools every year. And, and I spent 15 years in that 10 as the, as the chair, and I got to see the impact of, of education on individuals, families, generations, and communities. Because I got to meet some of the old blokes <laughs> That had, that had gone through the program. And typically after the, after the Second World War, these were um, boys whose dads were killed in the war who died so right soon after. So they, they got scholarships. They've gone on to do amazing things in their work and, and each subsequent generation is the same. And to a person, they've done stuff in the community because somebody gave them a chance. They don't know who they are. They've never met them, but they gave them a chance to help them to go to university, which they wouldn't have got to. And that's especially so at the moment. Kids in the country, it's really difficult to go from a country town to, the, to a city in the university and live and go to uni. It's just so expensive and so difficult. So um, after 15 years there, I joined a, a group that's now called Youth Thrive Victoria, and we provide scholarships, mentoring, leadership programs, and also go back into schools and um, help year 11 and year 12 kids keep them engaged in school and finish year 11 and year 12 um, mm. and interesting enough one of the areas that kids become disengaged in school which is I found extraordinary when I heard it is grade 5 that's the first time they start to get disengaged so our young people had seen this and they said well we, we're going to put together something and we run a program called Dream Seeds in primary schools so it's young people helping young people and, and that's the essence of our organisation. So we provide scholarships and um, Burke Britain has provided a scholarship to a, um, a young woman um, from Wodonga um, who will be here in Geelong studying next year, um, her second and third year. So um, she wouldn't otherwise have got to university. Like it just, just wouldn't have happened. And um, so why I talk about the baby boomers is I've been providing a scholarship through my business and I just realised I don't even have it on my website. <laughs> um, for the last four or five years and it's 30 grand right so it's 10 grand a year for three years and and I provide a bit of money to other things through the business as well and um, and then do so personally and I, I state that because I'm a baby boomer I'm going to die with more money than I ever thought I'd have and my kids don't need it all right and so for the baby boomers listening to this we've got enough you know so what's the impact you want to have while you're still here, mm. you know what can you what can you you do, and and I'd love it to be youth thrive. Have a look on our website, but but find something you're passionate about. You know it's Wombat's Wish or Kids Plus or, you know there's something where we can make a contribution now, um, either around our expertise or our money or both, and 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 that's the legacy I'd love the baby boomers to leave behind, rather than wealthy kids. You know our kids, my kids, Peter's. Um, Cookies kids, they'll be okay. They'll have enough. But some other kids or, you know, individuals don't. And that's, that's where we can play a role now. Not, and not just through our will. It's uh, interesting, the, just jump from Wombat's Wish, you thrive over to Kids Plus. Um, I think about three years ago, chatting to Sean when I, uh, about, I was, we were discussing this at breakfast before everyone arrived this morning. They've got. Um, we've set up a scholarship fund with Kids Plus Foundation to provide tertiary education support for young people with cerebral palsy that have been through the Kids Plus program, who come to the end of the year twelve and suddenly, and sadly, a lot of these young people are 
not just physically disadvantaged, mm. they also often are economically disadvantaged in situations that are pretty tough. And so we've got this amazing, uh, our target is to try and build this fund to half a million dollars so that we can provide 10 to 15 scholarships annually to young people so they've got a choice to go to tertiary education. They're not, your point a moment ago, Bruce, how expensive it is to relocate to have to fund your life and on top of being a university student. So um, we're, we're working that fund is up to 225 now and my target, Sean and I have got a target of getting that to half a mil within the next three years. And I think that's one of the things at, after the conversations earlier today, I'm now going to take that as a real focus for me to try and find people that can tip in a little bit, the baby boomer concept mm. a little bit, a lot of us tip in a little bit and let's bring that half a million forward let's try and do it in the next 18 months in a locket i think if we each have those sorts of targets and you give people a chance everyone wants to help some way yeah. we all have and it's good for you you said before you get back so much if mm. you give a bit what you get back comes back to you tenfold we all want to give we all want to help we want to make a difference but often people don't really know where to go to do that and so if there's a chance to say well i'd love to be a Youth Thrive Scholarship Provider. I'd love to help Wombats Wish and have another two camps a year funded. You know, we're, we're blessed because we are able to use the FG program and we fund a camp each year. I also want to make sure that, you know, the legacy I leave is when I'm no longer at Kids Plus. For as long as possible, young people graduate from Year 12 and can go and get a tertiary degree somewhere. And there's a young lady from, I think, Camp and Sean said, who will be doing an allied health degree next year who's getting the first scholarship at the moment which is really exciting because you know there's a cerebral palsy mm. participant in the kids plus program who is going to come through with lived experience and work with people in the future to help those mm. like her so we can all make a difference we just need to get off our ass and have a crack at doing mm. it and sometimes it might be a small financial commitment but really a thousand or two a year for a few years is insignificant really in the big picture but it, it makes a big difference if a lot of us do it mm. and, 100 and people give a thousand that's a massive contribution mm. but it's a small amount for each individual yeah and i think i think the three of us are um i mean none of us come from wealthy families right um and with an education and being born in the right well not born but living in the right country at the right time as as you know I mean, the disparaging marks about baby boomers, I don't listen to, um, but but we we were blessed um, to be born here, um, and and to have the opportunity to, if if you're in private enterprise, to to be successful if you've got your health, and um, you know the times now that to you know to see the benefits of your um, work beyond you know your kids. <laughs> being wealthy with that privilege comes a responsibility yeah too, doesn't it and yeah i think they're yeah. you know, a community and responsibility yeah but but I, I can just say that you know I, i'm clearly mind things about education and, and that's what kids plus are about as well is and and really i guess same with wombat's wish it's educating kids how to how to cope with a really difficult situation but but i can say by looking seeing the dafford lewis and seeing the impact it's had so just even more recently, some of the young young blokes that, um, or young people, they're not all blokes, um, uh, you know, Afghanis, uh, South Sudanese, you know, that these these people can bring amazing um, attributes to our country, um, but they need an education and they want one, mm. and so to support those, um, yeah. Mm. It's, it, Clearly, I'm passionate about it, Jay. It's good. It's good. <laughs> it's a good cause. Listen, I'm, I'm mindful of time, uh, but I, I suppose I just wanted to, uh, firstly thank the three of you for making the time to uh, have a chat on our little podcast uh cookie i like the that that concept of adding layers to your business mm. adding layers to your life and add, adding layers to other people's lives so it was uh, kind of it was very much an honor to sort of be a fly on the wall listening to 50 years of friendship and contribution to community and to business so thank you all for making the time uh, if we ever get a chance again i'd love to do a, a round two or round three with uh, with the three of you but Again, thanks for making the time. It's great to uh, great to be part of it. Thank you. It's been good. It's been really good. Thank you. And thanks for your friendship, guys. No, yeah. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you're keen to understand more about how financial advice could benefit you, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter 
at Burke Britain FP or Google Burke Britain Financial Partners. Check out our client reviews, testimonials, and make a time to meet one of our certified financial planners by clicking book now on our website. Thanks for listening. Any information contained in this podcast is of a general nature only. No account was taken as to the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. Therefore, before making any decision, listeners should consider the appropriateness of any information with regard to their particular objective, financial situation, needs, and seek independent advice from a licensed professional specific to their circumstances. All right, hit it. That translates to don't be a moron and act on what some random person says on a podcast. Take personal responsibility. Do your homework. Ask questions and speak to an actual human that knows what they're talking about before you do anything. PP Financial Solutions Proprietary Limited Trading Expert Britain Financial Partners are authorised representatives of AMP Financial Planning Limited AFS license number 232706.